So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, sponsored by the audiobook edition of Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, now available on iTunes and Audible.com, and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and, oh, so briefly, American League Baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg. Recommendations are worth what you pay for them, so I don't always accept them at face value. But the same literary agent who turned me on to young adult novelist Sarah Zarr two years ago thought I'd also enjoy James Dashner's new young adult book, The Maze Runner, enough that he sent me a copy without first asking. And Michael, who, in the interest of full disclosure, represents all three of us, and I'll point out to the other two that I was his client first, <laughs> even though... Uh, there is hardly a bit of similarity between the work of these two authors. You read me pretty well, so feel free to recommend something else. I think three and three years is probably a good pace. Anyway, The Maze Runner is the kind of book that teens and youthful readers of all ages in search of an appropriate follow-up to the adventures to the adventures of Harry Potter will no doubt enjoy. It takes place in a fantastical, impossible place, develops a language of its own, and features characters you will instantly love and hate. I'm sorry, Galley. This is the first book in a trilogy from Dashner, who you may already know as the author of the 13th Reality series. James, you old shucker, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi there. Glad to be back. Uh, are you back? <laughs> Didn't you interview me Have before? Have we done this before? Yes, I think Did so, we? for the 13th Reality. Maybe not. I... Maybe not. My bad. Oops. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, you do a, you do a lot of them. You do a lot of them. <laughs> that's true. I'm hey, very very excited so, to be here. Well, thank you. I, I'm 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 delighted to 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 have you. And I want to I want to uh, tell you something. I have read two thirds of the book. I I decided when I got about halfway that I was not going to finish before we spoke because <laughs> I did not want to be in any danger of giving away something at the end of the story because the oh. the, the the pace about halfway to where I am now has quickened so much that I just thought in my excitement, I might spill the beans. So I, I just Very need smart. you to know that I'm, I'm at two thirds and I thought that was fair. And I, um, you know, in, in, in talking to Sarah on her books, a little bit different dynamic. And here I just thought, you know, it would be awful if someone tuned in to learn something about you in the book and I screwed up. So I will finish I appreciate the book that. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. That's yeah. The ending is very important in this book, so I appreciate that. Well, and knowing that there's a second and third book behind it, I thought all the more important. Well, I'd I'd like to be able to like quiz you about those, and I will <laughs> talk to you a little bit about doing a trilogy. I, I didn't want to be in the position of giving something away, so I just thought I'm going to stop here. I think I, I think it. Uh, I, I think I've read. 275 of I think 359, 360 pages. I think that's okay. a good a good place for, to do this interview. <laughs> Great, uh, yeah. Well, now one of the things that that threw me off when I started reading the book though was all the invented language, like you know, shucker and mm -hmm. other things. Why not shank. just use standard language? Shank, thank you. Um, Griever, uh, why not just use standard language uh, or curse words? Well, you know, um, some people assume that I did it just as replacement words for slang words, but really my intent and goal from the beginning was, since this book is set in the future, quite a bit in the future, I just wanted their dialogue to have a different flavor. And so I thought, you know, as time passes, language changes, new words are developed, and that was really my biggest goal in using those words. So it wasn't just a matter of protecting a younger ears no i mean <clears throat> eventually that you know that was definitely thought of as part of the process but you'll notice uh, m the words are never really used exactly as replacements for any swear words so i don't know it's kind of mostly the first thing a little bit of the second thing i guess so it's i'm sorry it, it's not these words are not replacing swear words well not per se i mean they're they're main intent was was just to give their dialogue a kind of a different flavor a futuristic flavor and and show that they've 
kind of been isolated and developed a few words on their own. See, and I, I thought these were some of the most foul-mouthed kids I've ever encountered. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's some of that too, for sure. You know, I I didn't want to completely cut off, you know, a lot of my younger readers. So, you know, that was part of it as well. Okay. Well, that's that's a fair answer. Um, and I want to uh, also, before we go too far, if uh, if you're listening to us live and you've got a question for James Dashner, give us a call one six four six five. I'm sorry, 595-3135. Uh, we'll get you in the queue, and uh, if, uh, if, as long as James is not in the middle of an answer, I will put you on immediately. So 1646-595-3135. Um, and is any of this language, uh, is it found in the 13th Reality series? Uh, no. No, this is completely different story, different time, different setting, so... So yeah, this was this was unique to the Maze Runner for sure. Okay, so it's not there's not a there's not a dictionary that's going to be needed to read all of your books just <laughs> one set at a time. Yeah, and you know it's kind of funny because it does give you it makes you feel a little disoriented at first to read some of these words, and I think our purpose was to kind of make the reader feel like Thomas as he's entering this new society, kind of make you feel a little bit off base, and then I think you get used to it pretty quickly as you read through the book, kind of like he does. I would agree with that a thousand percent because it, oh, it definitely threw me off, uh, you know, the first, you know, 50 or 60 pages. I'm just like I, disoriented. I, I would say that I felt as he did that, you know, why, why can't these people answer a, a straight question with a straight answer? <laughs> and and why, why, you know, why do they use these words that they use? I mean, I, yeah. I, for a while I thought, is you know, am I going to find out that James is British? I don't see anything in his background <laughs> British, but, but some of the way they talk, it seems like it, you know, it could come straight out of uh, Hogwarts at times. And yeah, it's very. Uh, I, I appreciate that, and I think that uh, my editor really helped me with that. She actually, I had a little bit more of it, and she kind of pulled some of it back a little. I think it's just the right amount now. So I'm glad that you thought that as you read it. And actually. Um, uh, we have a con we have a live uh, web chat that accompanies uh, the Mr. Media interviews, and uh, one of our listeners uh, named Lerner, oddly enough, uh -huh. uh, or coincidentally enough, uh, says that Clockwork Orange used the same techniques. Its uh, its vocabulary was derived from Russian. So. Oh, okay. Interesting. Just, uh, you learn something every day. It's it's on a good day, yes. <laughs> and I do love that movie, so maybe indirectly it influenced me. Now, um, uh, also before we get too far along, James or Jim? And, and I ask because halfway through the Maze Runner, and I will give this away, we discover that Thomas is more comfortable being called Tom. Oh, yeah. You know, I I prefer James. A lot of people assume I go by Jim, but I usually go by James. And James definitely, not, definitely not Jimmy. Okay. Oh, I'm just going <laughs> to call you Jimmy. You must have read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, you and again, can call Thomas, me. You can call me Jimmy if you want. Well, no, I won't. But but, but <laughs> Thomas, uh, he 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 takes note at the point, at one point that that someone else calls him Tommy, and that also makes him seem a little more comfortable. I think so. It's interesting. Yeah, I um, think it's kind of a link, an almost subconscious link he feels to his past when he hears that. You know, mm -hmm. a little bit more familiar, I guess. What is it that kind of inspired this? type of book from you it's you know it has a language it, it's a it's a very different kind of story mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, you can get I would imagine some young readers would get very upset and frustrated with what's happening to some of these kids yeah it's it's definitely a darker story than I've ever written before I think it was influenced by a lot of things a couple of books I loved growing up uh, were Ender's Game and Lord of the Flies Mm -hmm. And I think kind of the tone and feel of those books came into this one. And I've also always had a love for dystopian, apocalyptic type fiction. And just the idea that, you know, there's this, even if it's a slight possibility, the possibility that there's this future that exists where these things could actually happen. And, and so kind of all that went into it. And I just wanted a really good, solid 
mystery adventure, uh, you know, story that had a lot of depth to it. And I think it was influenced by the show Lost as well. So that's kind of all the things that helped me lead to it, I guess. Kind of a real uh, dark potpourri. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've really enjoyed all those things I mentioned, and and this is kind of, you know, they're mostly indirectly, but all those things led to the creation of this story. Now, I wonder if uh, early on in the story, if I missed some direct hints of this, but, uh, you know, for quite a while at the beginning, it wasn't clear to me that this was taking place in a society where there was a lot of, where there was any technology, and then suddenly we, we learn about, you know, how how the uh, the runners and and the uh, the shanks and how you know how they how they get their supplies mm-hmm. and that they have I think they have a dishwasher and you know suddenly it's like oh and then you know when you see the and, and this way I'm, I'm trying to tread lightly here you see the descriptions of the grievers and and suddenly you realize that there might be some technology involved there mm-hmm. um, but uh, you know for quite a while reading the book starting in I wasn't convinced that this was a technological society that they were kind of spun oh. from. But then yeah, I, I missed something early on. No, it's probably, you know, another kind of along the lines of, of Thomas learning about the place, you know, as he does, learning along with him. Yeah, actually, you know, this this story slowly reveals to you in the first book that there's, you know, as you, especially as you get further along towards the end, you realize there's actually some really serious advanced technology going on. And then, and that'll be a big part of the trilogy as a whole. So it's really important actually. Hmm. Now I I mentioned uh, uh, in the introduction that uh, I, I, in my mind anyway, and it's interesting, I'll be honest, I didn't read the Potter books except for the first one, which my wife and I took turns reading with my daughter when she was very young until she took over reading them herself, I never mm-hmm. got into reading them. I just, I just didn't. But okay. the, the idea of the books, and you know, I've watched all the movies, and I certainly am up on all the, uh, um, uh, the genre uh, of what's going on there. But it just seems to me that for someone who loved that stuff and wishes there was more of it, this fits in. Now, the reason I mentioned about the technology, though, is. In that world, the technology, as we think of it, only exists in the outside world. It doesn't exist in Hogwarts and, and their mm-hmm. world. Uh, and I wondered if it was, you know, if there's a, a conscious effort, uh, you know, maybe to differentiate what you've done or just, you know, to, to be involved with some technology and just basic stuff. Yeah, I think that's definitely a part of it that um, within the glade and within the maze, you know, they, they do have just kind of your typical, you know, electricity, stuff like that. But, you know, I don't want to ruin the end for you either, but uh, towards the right, end, they, right. they start to realize on a lot of levels that things are much bigger than they appear. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's yeah. not like a virtual reality world or anything like that, but, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that, that they don't really realize until they get towards the end. So they're not on the holodeck of the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> no, they're not. I always, you know, when I tell people what I just told you, it always seems like they guess, oh, they're in some kind of virtual reality world like the Matrix, but uh, they're not. I can definitely say that's not the answer. Hmm. Does it uh, does it bother you at all to be in this genre where, where Harry Potter's name comes up almost all the time? No, no, not at all. I mean, you know... It's it's an honor to ever be mentioned. I mean, I absolutely love the Harry Potter books. I've read all seven, and I I respect J.K. Rowling tremendously, and I'm so thankful that she has really helped boost this you know this whole industry in the children's market. I mean, she really I feel strongly that she paved the way for all of us to to find more success. So I'm. Even if it's good or bad, being mentioned in the same breath is is great. I love it. 
Well, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, um, how you do um, what you do. Um, uh, Learner in the web chat has, has a specific question about this, and I have a few more. Um, do you work out your books and the trilogies in in great detail before writing, or do you work them out as you write? I I'm kind of in between. I I really like to know the basic storyline, kind of on a high level. So a lot of times for a book, I will do maybe a page or two of, of of notes, kind of bullet points about what the story is. And I really, really feel strongly about knowing how a book ends um, before I write it. But I don't I don't do really detailed, you know, pages and pages of outlining like some authors I know. And with the Maze Runner trilogy specifically, you know, at the very beginning, I just kind of had this idea for one book. But early on in the planning process, I kind of had some epiphanies about some cool plot twists. And then that's when I started thinking of it as a trilogy, and the, and the whole story arc kind of came together like that. Hmm. So I'm kind of in between. I, I don't just write off the cuff, but I don't do very, very detailed outlines either. Okay. And... How long, you know, The Maze Runner, for example, which is not your first book. You have the, the other series going. How long did it take you to actually write the book from, you know, conception to completion? Well, it has kind of an interesting story that, you know, I, I love to tell aspiring writers because <clears throat> I actually wrote the first draft a few years ago. And at that point, you know, I, I felt like the story was really strong, but that my writing still needed a lot of work. So I didn't work on it. I kind of put it aside for a couple of years and then I pulled it back out and basically rewrote the whole thing. So I would say that first draft took me maybe three or four months. And then I went a couple of years without doing much. And then it, I spent another few months rewriting it. And, uh, and that's, it was about a year and a half ago we sold it to random house. So, you know, in literal time, it was three years. Actual writing time, probably eight or nine months. Hmm. That's about average I, now. I think people would be surprised how much better, especially people who want to write, how much better their stuff would be if they if they worked it out and then they set it aside for a while and came back to it. You can see oh, it a yeah. lot more, uh, you know, independently. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, even if it's just a month, it's amazing when you go back. You just can't believe some of the stuff you missed. It's very valuable. <laughs> Even after it's published, you can't believe some of the things you missed. So well, it never stops. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's true. I, I've, yeah. you know, I've, I, I work mostly in nonfiction, and, and, and I've picked up some of the books I've worked on you know, five and ten years ago, and I go, oh, my God, I can't believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. It's, it's just, so good know, to hear. Yeah. It's, it's, just kind it's of good to hear by. the other authors go through that, too, because it's so true. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what, what, have there been any writers who have been uh, who have either you know directly mentored you or you know, directly or indirectly have been helpful and in, in, in guiding you over the years? Definitely, definitely. I I've gotten to know a few fantasy authors like um, Tracy Hickman, who writes the the Dragonlance book with Margaret Weiss and mm -hmm. Lee Monisett Jr. and and then. Um, and those guys are, have really helped me a lot. Also, David Farland or Dave Wolverton. I've always okay. looked up to them, and I, and I met them at a few conferences, and they gave me a lot of advice. And then I kind of have a core group of author friends um, that I've met over the years that have given me a lot of moral support and stuff like that. So, and you know, you mentioned Sarah, Sarah Zarr. You know, I don't know where I'd be without her because she's the one who – who helped me get my agent? So our agent, our Michael. agent, yeah. Let's, yes, let's, our let's agent. Make sure we're careful on that. <laughs> <laughs> Whom you have yeah, actually, first? Should, that's right. Just so we're all <laughs> clear on that. I have to remind Sarah. Sarah has great, feels great ownership of Michael, and I got to make it clear. I was there first, guys. <laughs> I think he was a mail clerk when I signed on with him. Um, <laughs> not really, but close. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just I just understood actually right before we uh, we started the interview that uh, that you and Sarah knew each other and that she had referred you uh, to mm -hmm. Michael. So kind of a yes, kind of a small yes. 
It's a small world in this author community. And uh, how and where do you do your writing? You know, can you write anywhere, or do you have to be in a certain place? Or I like that. I think my probably my defining thing is I like variety. So mm-hmm. I've we just moved into a new house, and I this is the first time I've ever actually had an office in my house, and so I do quite a bit there. But usually I spend at least half a day if I if I'm having a writing day, going to either a cafe or a bookstore or the library, or even you know in a chair outside with my laptop. Just So I, I can pretty much do it anywhere, but I do like the atmosphere of a place that has books. So, you know, bookstores and libraries are usually where I end up. So you do a lot of writing in the bathroom? No, sorry, never mind. <laughs> well, back in yeah, my house out. growing up, that would have been true for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny as you were saying that, that you've, you've got a, an office in, in your home for the first time. I was just thinking about how... You know, I've been writing for, gosh, well, let's just say I've owned my own home for 20-some years, and it's actually gone, been going backwards. When I, before we had a child, I had, I had a whole room to myself, and uh-huh. then uh, my daughter was born, and then I got moved off to the family room, which became more an office than a family room, but I still had to share it with the household and the dogs. Yeah. And then as my daughter got bigger, and we needed that family room, <laughs> and a place where she can entertain her friends and watch TV and play video games. Uh, yep. I've been shunted off to less and less space each time. Now I'm I'm in a corner of the living room, and it's, I'm just thinking, <laughs> where will yeah. I go next? How much smaller you'll, can my space? You'll be in the garage next, I'm sure. No, I worry I, about. It. Yeah, <laughs> you know we we have four kids, and and we lived in kind of a little starter home for about ten years, and yeah, I mean we had zero space for any kind of working. I never, ever worked at home. I'd always go somewhere else. But uh, in my new house, we did make one of the bedrooms an office, so it's great. It's kind of of away from everybody. I can close the door, and my wife says she doesn't know if I'm home unless she looks in the garage to see if my car is there. So it's kind of nice. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good deal. That's good. I I wish I could. uh, Well, never mind. I don't want to insult my wife. Um, (laughs) Maybe a little. Um, uh, Lerner has another question from the web chat, um, and that is, uh, what did you feel needed improvement in your writing, and how did you go about it? Oh, yeah. It's, you know, that's that's been the thing I've worked hardest on over the last four or five years is several things. I would say that number one is kind of the characterization. You know, my early writing, I feel like all the characters were just kind of exactly the same. They all spoke the same. They acted the same, reacted to things the same. So I really tried to think about each of my characters, develop them, you know, differentiate them from each other. That's one thing. I would say also just adding depth to my books. So, you know, more internal thought from the characters, more setting of the scenery, more, you know, I use the five senses more, you know, what what do they smell, what do they see, what do they hear, what do they feel, stuff like that. And I, I've, the other thing I would say is I've learned to be more patient in my writing. I used to be so anxious to write the next scene that I would rush too much. But I, I've kind of learned patience and develop developed stories and scenes and stuff like that a little slower pace. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking about the first part of that answer, and you, you said uh, early on that uh, your characters all seem to speak the same way and sound the same. And I, was, mm-hmm. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I was thinking, hey, David Milch has made a huge career out of doing that. <laughs> uh, you know, and NYPD Blue, if you ever watched that, all yeah. the characters spoke with the same Bronx, yeah. Brooklyn accent, no matter where they were from, no matter what their background, <laughs> whether they were cops or perps or DAs, they all had spoke the same way and uh, uh, same thing on Deadwood uh, oh yeah they, they all spoke with that you know that very lyrical uh, Shakespearean mm-hmm. uh, sound and you know it drove me nuts as uh, basically as a writer I, I couldn't believe that he couldn't have people you know, speak from where they were from and still be very lyrical and right but, uh, you know I guess it, I guess it worked for notes I really shouldn't uh, run it down huh? <laughs> yeah you know I guess what works for different people works but I totally know it totally see what you're saying yeah i you know that kind of i feel like the maze runner i had a couple of friends who 
who read through that first draft I was telling you about. Um, one in particular, her name was Stacy Whitman. She's just a good friend and an editor. She she really pointed that out to me and and helped me realize, oh, I got to change these characters. So the Maze Runner actually, you know, kind of has the before and after type feel to it. If well, I would never let anyone read that first draft, but if you did, you'd be able to see that. <laughs> got it. <laughs> well, I'd like to read that. No. <laughs> um, uh, before I ask you the next question, I want to uh, uh, just give you a chance. You've got some uh, appearances coming up, I think. Yes. Yes. Right? Um, we're we're in the kind of the middle of a three week tour across the country, so I'm really excited about uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night. We'll be in New York City at the Barnes and Noble Barnes and Noble in Manhattan on 86th Street. That'll be October 15th for anyone listening to this uh, recorded. Yeah, yeah it's going to be really cool because uh, Scott Westerfeld and Carrie Ryan and Michael Grant will also be there. We're kind of doing a post-apocalyptic panel, <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of fun. And then from there, I'll be going to Washington, D.C., and then head out west to Salt Lake City, Phoenix, and L.A. So the full schedule is on my website if, if anyone wanted to take a look. James Dash. Well, I was just going to oh, okay. See, I'm at, uh, I guess I'm at, I'm at your blog, which is jamesdashner.blogspot.com. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Same thing. Jamesdashner.com sends you there. And if you look at the top right corner, there's a link to my tour. There it is. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I was looking at the blog post and I didn't see that. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you got that information out. <laughs> yeah, I need to put it in uh, bigger letters, I think. <laughs> Maybe, or it may be something, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, you had uh, you had a very different life be- before you became a writer. Um, was oh, your last yeah. career a, kind of a tortured existence for you, or was it just a, was it just a placeholder? Re- yeah, you're going to reveal my dark, dirty secret. Yes, I... Finance. <laughs> yes, I worked in finance, accounting. Uh, I had my CPA, of all things. Um, you know, when I went to college, I just kind of had this practical side to me. I know that that time I had this dream of becoming an author, but I also knew I'd have to have a day job. So I studied accounting basically because my uncle told me once that accountants always have jobs. That was the whole basis of Mm -hmm. my career choice. And, you know, I never, I won't lie, I never liked it very much at all. (laughs) If anything, it gave me more motivation to, to have my author career take off. And it's the Maze Runner is what has really changed my life. When we sold that, I was finally able to to leave that career path behind forever and become a full-time author. So it's been really great. Hmm. Well, um, we're going to have to wrap up in a second, but I, I've got to ask you, uh, you've written a book, and it's what we've been mostly talking about, is the Maze Runner. And uh, you did talk about you know uh, adding depth, to storytelling. So I want to ask you, where is the maze in your own life? Where is the maze in my own life? What are you trying to escape day to day? Um, you know, that is a deep question. Wow. I would say... <laughs> I saved it for the end. <laughs> I think my biggest issue in my life now, and, and our agent Michael could definitely tell you this, is I need to get over this, you know, I just worry too much about my author career, about sales, about reviews, about how the book's being received. And I'm trying to not let that consume my life. And and Michael's helped me with that a lot. So I'm really surprised and kind of pleased with myself that I've, I've just had a blast on this tour. I'm not I've just kind of hypnotized myself not to worry about reviews and sales and all that and just having the confidence that, you know, I'm pretty much new, so that this book will, will take time and build, but eventually I, I really have confidence it's going to do well. So I think I've gotten a lot better at being happy and being relaxed as an author. So is that a good enough answer? That's a very good answer. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Because I, I do mean it. I do mean it. <laughs> I really well, do mean uh, it. So. 
Well, folks, listen, you can find James Dashner's new book, The Maze Runner, as well as his previous works in the 13th Reality series in great bookstores pretty much everywhere, I think, or you can order it online at mrmedia.com, Mr. Media. And you can see James on tour this month, October 2009. Uh, check his blog, uh, james-dashner.blogspot.com. The upper right-hand corner has a list of dates and places. Uh, or you can go to themazerunner.com. Um, you can also follow James on Twitter at twitter.com slash dashner, D-A-S-H-N-E-R. And uh, James, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, thanks so much for joining us in Mr. Media today. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. My pleasure. And you come back next time, and then we'll talk about Welcome Back. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you for that. (laughs) All right. All right. Best of luck to you. Hey, thanks a lot. We'll see you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. And, folks, for more interviews with your favorite novelists, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with Sarah Zarr, who we spoke about, Monty Schultz, son of Charles Schultz, Peter Gallenbach, John Darden, Sue Ann Jafarian, James Sheehan, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, blogcritics.org, TrueSlant, Pointer Online, Digital Journal, Vox, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Zimbio, Current, or Odeo. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. Or subscribe to Mr. Media's blog on the Amazon Kindle Reader. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and come spend it with us. Thanks for listening, everybody.